ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, I am Brian Lee Crowley, Managing Director of the McDonald Laurier Institute. And on behalf of the Institute uh, and our Board of Directors and the Aurea Foundation, our event sponsor, I'd like to welcome you to this special event on the theme of Dragon with a Checkbook, Acon, China, and the challenges to Canada's policy on foreign investment. We really appreciate you coming, and I'd particularly like to uh, note the presence of uh, four MPs we're delighted to have uh, uh, who are seated in the back of the room because question period, unfortunately, comes up fairly soon and they will slip away, but not because of any lessened interest in the topic. Uh, uh, Ziad Al-Boutif, uh, James Bazan, Dan Albus, Aaron O'Toole, welcome. Delighted to have you. Uh, we also have several members of the uh, diplomatic community and many other uh, 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 groups and organizations around Ottawa. As you might know, uh, MLI has been a leader in Canada in raising tough questions about the ambitions of the Chinese regime and the issues around investment by Chinese state-owned enterprises in Canada, all within the context of how Canada can vigorously protect its interests while engaging safely and thoughtfully with this rising Asian power. Several years ago, we helped to inform the government's actions on the proposed takeover of Nexon with public commentary and a high-level panel just like this one today that generated significant media attention. And it's no exaggeration to say that we had a major impact on the government's decision in that Nexon case. But we cannot rest on our laurels, and that is why we continue today to raise the thorny and troubling national security implications of unrestricted access to Chinese SEOs to buy Canadian companies. That is the genesis of today's event, examining CCCI's proposed takeover of the ACON Group. With the proposed ACON transaction now undergoing a full security review, the Government of Canada is close to making a decision that will have an enormous lasting impact on our country. MLI's thought leadership on this issue is therefore more vital than ever. This is not just any corporate takeover. As one of today's panelists, MLI Monk Senior Fellow Duanji Chen has written, and Duanji, of course, is a panel today, on the panel today, CCI's acquisition of Acon is undoubtedly motivated by Beijing's aspirations for a more dominant global role and backed by its government's financial power. What are the stakes? What are the risks and opportunities for Canada? And how should our government approach the growing presence of Chinese state-owned enterprises? What has been the experience of peer countries like the US, Australia, and New Zealand in the face of these challenges? Because, mark my words, we are not alone. To help answer these questions, MLI is pleased to bring together some of the leading thinkers on the economic and security implications of closer ties to China to tackle these difficult questions and find the answers that will help preserve Canadian security and prosperity. Our first speaker, Monk Senior Fellow Duanji Chen, will set the scene for today's discussion. An independent scholar with a PhD in economics, Dr. Chen was a research fellow at the School of Policy Studies at the University of Calgary and research associate and associate director with the International Tax Program at the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto. And for th nearly three decades, she served as a consultant to various international organizations, national government bodies, and business and nonprofit organizations. She will be followed by our keynote speaker, Ward Elcock. Mr. Elcock spent more than 40 years in the Canadian Public Service. Most recently, he was Special Advisor on Human Smuggling and Illegal Migration at the Privy Council Office. Prior to that appointment, he was Federal Coordinator of Olympic uh, G8 and G20 Security, Deputy Minister of National Defence, Director of CSIS, and Deputy Clerk for Security and Intelligence at the Privy Council Office. After those two opening uh, talks, a panel discussion will take place, moderated by MLI's uh, uh, Monk Senior Fellow, Shuvaloy Majumdar, uh, who is the acting head of our new Centre for Advancing Canada's Interests Abroad. There, our first two speakers will be joined by Dr. Charles Burton, who is an Associate Professor at Brock University, specialising in comparative politics, government and politics of China, Canada-China relations, and human rights. Dr. Burton, of course, served as counselor at the Canadian Embassy to China from 1991 to 93, and then again from 98 to 2000. Some may wonder why we didn't get any speakers to comment more positively on the ACON deal. The answer is, we are not a debating society. 
We exist to analyze and then explain and promote what we believe to be public policy in the national interest. When we do an event later this year on NATO's response to Russia's behavior in uh, uh, Ukraine and elsewhere, we will not be inviting the Russians to participate in the name of balance. The same goes, the same, you can applaud if you like, that's a, yes, quite right. Um, the same goes for the ACON purchase. This is especially true when the topic in question is not on the economic benefits of the purchase, but rather its security implications. Not what is good for the company, but what is good for the country. We have consulted numerous national security experts and our concerns were widely shared. Our concern is not the proposed ACON transaction, but the framework, both legislative and regulatory, that we can and should apply to all such transactions. It is on that topic that we will be having a thoughtful and exhaustive discussion. And uh, for that reason, I'm delighted to have our very knowledgeable and expert panel to address what we see as this important challenge facing Canadian national security. By the way, this event also turns out to be emblematic of the fiercely guarded independence of MLI, in that the CEO of ACON and the chief proponent of the sale of that company, John Beck, is a valued member of our advisory council. <laughs> the board and the advisory council, however, and this is something it's worthwhile to know about the Institute, the board and the advisory council are formally forbidden by resolution from influencing the substantive policy work of the Institute. John and I had a very thoughtful exchange about our event, and to his great credit, he has respected the independence that is the indispensable foundation of our work. Just a word about MLI for those of you who may be new to us. We celebrated our eighth birthday uh, uh, in March. When we launched the Institute eight years ago, it was our ambition to provide something previously unknown in Ottawa, a national think tank in the national capital talking about national issues to national policymakers, the national media, and the national electorate. The international think tank rankings consistently rank us the top think tank in Ottawa and one of the top four or five in the country. Those same rankings found us one of the top three new think tanks in the world in 2013. Our first book, The Canadian Century, Moving Out of America's Shadow, won the Sir Anthony Fisher Prize for the top think tank book internationally. And just last year, our work on Aboriginal Canada and the natural resource economy was shortlisted for the top global prize for think tank project. Uh, national security, defense, and foreign affairs concerns are increasingly moving to center stage in our work as this event attests. Finally, I would ask for one thing from our audience. If possible, I would ask that you avoid taking photos during the uh, formal part of the event without going into specifics. Some of our panelists have requested not to be photographed, and we'll be working with our professional photographer and videographer to edit them out of the resulting public photos and videos. Thank you for your cooperation. Now, please allow me to welcome to the podium Duanji Chen, and Duanji will speak for 15 minutes. Duanji. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Brian, for your kind introduction. To set the scene for our keynote speaker, I will provide some basic facts around the CCCI ACON deal. I believe this deal is an integral part of China's national strategy. I also believe our debate on this deal can be categorized by asking two critical questions. First, is CCCI's takeover of ACON an everyday firm-to-firm -firm acquisition? And the second, should we have a national strategy to counter that of China's? My answer to the first question is an absolute no, and I will explain why. I will leave the second question to our policymakers. I will now focus on three straightforward issues. First, who is CCCC? Second, what is China's national strategy for its SOEs? And finally, how does the CCCI ACON deal fit into China's national strategy? First, who is CCCC? 
We know CCCC is CCCI's parent company, and the CCCC stands for China Communications Construction Company Limited. CCCC was incorporated in 2006. It came about from the 2005 merger between China Road and Bridge Corporation, CRBC, and the China Harbor Engineering Company, CHEC. CCCC soon took over another SOE, ZPMC, which specializes in manufacturing uh, cranes and the large steel structures. And the ZPMC's acquisition of the Houston-based FG helped enhance CCCC's early stage design capabilities and expand its business into manufacturing offshore drilling equipment. Following further mergers, CCCC also emerged in 2010 to become one of the only 16 central SOEs that were allowed to stay in the real estate industry. Here, the central SOEs mean those SOEs under the direct control of the powerful SASAC, that is, the State-Owned Assets Supervision and Administration Commission of the State Council. In 2007, CCCC created its solely owned investment subsidiary, CCCI, initially only to generate a stable cash flow through investment. CCCI acquired Australia firm John Holland in 2015 as its sole subsidiary. It now wants to do the same to Aquan. With such government funded mergers and acquisitions, CCCC's total assets exploded from 79 billion yuan in 2005 to 884 billion yuan in 2017, a more than tenfold increase within 14 years. CCCC entered the Fortune Global 500 in 2008 and has since upped its ranking by more than 300 spots to 110th by 2017, with its total revenue reached $62 billion in 2016. CCCC can now boast of being the world's number one engineering and construction company in port construction, highway and bridge design and construction, dredging, container crane manufacturing, and offshore drilling platform design. Over the past decade, CCCC has built the Malta Dry Dock, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor instruction, uh, Infrastructure, the Sri Lanka Port City, the Mongolia-China Railroad, and the infra infrastructure for air and the naval bases on disputed island in the South China Sea. Amazingly, CCCC never hides, uh, never hides but glorifies its island building in the South China Sea. In summary, CCCC is a giant and, uh, and well-resourced SOE, mainly through domestic mergers among its SOE siblings. CCCC also wants to attain a global superiority through acquiring the top foreign brands backed by the government financing and the market manipulation, as I will explain later. One of its ambitions is to become the top international company in ocean construction, ranging from island building to exploiting seabed resources. Now, what's China's national strategy for its SOEs? After more than a decade-long rumbling about what to do with its SOEs, China started its SOE reform in earnest in early 1990s, with an initial goal of improving the sector's efficiency. The main approach at the time was twofold. 
The first was breaking up the monopoly of some uh, major SOEs that w uh, to facilitate inter-industry competition. The other was unloading those SOEs. They were either extremely inefficient or non-essential or both by liquidating them or selling them, often at a token price. During this process, millions of SOE employees were let go without adequate compensation, and the state's assets shrank at an alarming speed. So, in 2003, the government founded SASAC, as I mentioned earlier, with a clear goal of preserving and growing the state capital. SASAC has since um, been on mission to recreate super SOEs through shuffling state capital and restructuring, mainly merging its SOEs. As a result, from 2003 to 2017, the number of central, central SOEs had been halved from 196 to 98. And the number of such SOEs entered the global, uh, Fortune Global 500 increased from 6 to 48. Their total assets also grew by more than 700% from 9 trillion to 75 trillion yuan. Note that China's GDP grew only, only by 400% over the same period. So in other words, the growth of China's SOE, particularly those central SOEs, exceeded the overall economy, the growth of the overall economy, given the infamous low profitability of SOEs, which is below, was below 3% last year. It is obvious that the rapid growth of SOEs are funded by the government through both direct government appropriation and the state bank lending to implement its national strategy for global expansion. While global expansion in turn is a major, if not sole purpose of creating monstrous SOEs through internal um, mergers. For example, in its 2015 guidelines on deepening its SOE reform, the government states that its SOEs has been largely integrated into the market economy. Mind you, China is not a market economy. It says most central SOEs have merged emerged as backbone SOEs that are powerful and influential, influential in both domestic and international markets. That is a clear revelation that China has been intentionally using SOEs as its agents to compete in the global market by taking advantage of its open and free system. In the meantime, efficiency concern and the lack of innovation has been the lasting shadow of China's SOEs. Against this backdrop, the government also in 2015 promulgated Made in China 2025. In this document, the most relevant to the CCCI ACON deal is the government's call direct call for exploring how to utilize the industrial funds, state capital, and other channels to support our high-speed rail, power equipment, automobiles, engineering, and the construction, and advance the industrial capacity to go global and to conduct overseas investment and the mergers and the acquisitions. Now, finally, let's see how does the CCCI ACON deal fit in China's national strategy. In its recent report on CCCC's achievements, 
the SASAC summarized the CCCC's most distinct, uh, distinctive strengths as being always on the same page of the national strategy while mastering the industrial and the market trend. The CCCC's board chairman, Mr. Liu, also declared that CCCC has set its mission as the investor of the state capital. He emphasizes that the CCCC headquarters should provide a solid financial platform so as to be always ready whenever the acquisition target appears. In this regard, the CCCI Acorn deal is the implementation of CCCC's mission as the investor of the state capital. Like all other Chinese SOEs in their overseas acquisitions, CCCC is not aiming on profit but market share, particularly the market share in developed countries. But how does CCCC make these deals? Mr. Liu said candidly, entering the market of developed countries shouldn't start from ground, ground zero. What they have done is keeping an eye on the top five companies in the targeted country, patiently waiting for the buying opportunity. As soon as the target appeared on their radar screen, they made the offer immediately. This was how CCCC took over Houston-based FG and Australia's John Holland, and it's how it is attempting to acquire Acorn now. Of course, nothing wrong with what Mr. Liu said as a commercial strategy. The question here is, who in our free market system can afford such a grand strategy without the backing of the state capital? China's dominant force in exercising such a strategy has created an unfair game in our free market system. In Mr. Liu's words, we are already the first class international contractor what we are doing now is not fighting for scale, but for supply chain, for human capital, for science and technology, and for management and control. That is, we are fighting for soft power. Does this sound like a commercial statement or a political one? Keep in mind that Mr. Liu, the board chairman of CCCC, is also the party secretary of CCCC. So my conclusion is China has a clear national strategy to dominate the world, which is the core of so-called China dream. Despite our genuine hope and accommodation for its peaceful rise, China has seen the Western world as a rival and even a hostile one. Its SOEs, including CCCC, have seen their global expansion as a success in their dance with Wolf to this day. This is also in Mr. Liu's uh, original wording. The danger, I think, lies in our laziness in strategic thinking and the refusal to take a long-term view. We could harm ourselves if we insist on opening our doors widely to a state who does not believe in the private property rights and the free market system, but is using its SOEs in the disguise of commercial entities to tear our free and the transparent system apart by acquiring our top brand companies one by one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Duanji. As, as is always the case with anything to do with China, as soon as you start citing numbers, they are so stunning that it sort of takes your breath away. Uh, before I introduce uh, Ward Elcock, may I just uh, mention that uh, 
Uh, two more uh, MPs have joined the audience, uh, Robert Falcon Willett, who we're delighted to have uh, with us, as well as uh, Arnold Viersen. Uh, and um, I should also mention that uh, David Kilgore, a former longtime member of parliament and uh, um, Minister of State for Asia Pacific Affairs, I think, uh, is also in the audience. So welcome to all of you. Uh, it's now Ward Elcock's turn. Ward, will you come to the podium? Good afternoon. Uh, this is the first time that I've actually, can I just steal back my water bottle in case I need it in the midst here? Thank you. Um, this is the first time I have uh, visited the Institute. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here anywhere where somebody describes you as both learned and expert in the introduction <laughs> has got to be positive. Um, the subject this afternoon is, uh, th that I was given was whether the acquisition uh, of the Canadian construction company, Acon, by a Chinese uh, state-owned enterprise, an SOE, uh, should be permitted or denied on the grounds of national security. Um, the reality is, however, that this is just one of the growing list of acquisitions made by Chinese companies in Canada uh, in, in recent times. Uh, a, a reality that should not surprise us, uh, given the growing power of the Chinese economy, uh, but which ought to cause us to reflect on whether there should be limits uh, to Chinese, on Chinese acquisitions in Canada. Um, in each of the recent cases that have uh, danced through the news media, the rhetoric uh, tends to be the same. Uh, around each specific, whether it's one, whether it's whatever kind of company it is, it is that's involved. Um, on one side, there are those who uh, see the potential benefits to trade in the Canadian economy uh, as reasons to proceed. Others see the risks to, um, in particular, national security posed by uh, representatives by the by allowing Chinese companies to acquire Canadian companies as, in effect, representatives of a state that, under, that notwithstanding the enormous um, achievements, uh, is neither democratic, uh, indeed growing less so, nor governed by the, the rule of law in any, in any state that we would recognize, but rather the diktat of the Communist Party of China, uh, with all that that entails, all while imposing both formal and informal barriers to entry or success in some cases into its own markets. China is, however, an important part of the global economy and a major Canadian trading partner. Uh, as a consequence, it seems to me we need to find a balance between those two sides that allows us to reconcile our need to trade uh, and diversify our trade uh, relationships and our responsibility to protect our own interests, in particular our national security interests. As to where the balance should lie, each case will, I suspect, be different, unless and until uh, we reach a point where we achieve greater certainty on what is acceptable and what is not. Can we codify uh, what it is we believe in some sort of arrangement? Um, uh, in some cases, um, it will be relatively easy. Um, the acquisition by Ambang of a company uh, managing, real uh, managing retirement homes uh, would seem to carry little national security risks, although those who approved the acquisition uh, probably should, might have thought of doing some more diligence given what has since happened to Ambang. Um, but national security risks, it's hard to find. Um, the, um, in, other, in other cases, um, the acquisition of companies holding, for example, sensitive military technology, um, assuming it is in fact a sensitive technology, something we in the public cannot, cannot always be certain of, 
obviously poses much more serious red flags uh, in terms of Chinese acquisition, but not only by China. There are still those who believe that the, the acquisition of McDonnell Deadweiler should not have been approved uh, in its sale to an American entity. Uh, so it's, it, it is something, it is a, a requirement for us to look at not only Chinese acquisitions, but others. So where does ACON um, fit in, in, that, in that continuum? Um, some have argued that uh, because that, that, the, that, that the transaction would essentially allow um, the Chinese controlled company to effectively bid on sensitive military intelligence projects in Canada. Um, that seemed to me somewhat overheated rhetoric in point of fact, um, because in reality uh, such fears are, are exaggerated. Uh, it would anybody who was attempting to build such a facility would require clearances. It is highly unlikely that any Chinese company, controlled company, would be able to secure those, uh, those, those security clearances to in fact participate in the construction of such an exercise. So in a narrow security sense, national security sense, it seems to me uh, that the acquisition of ACON does not necessarily pose enormous risks. Uh, even if there are um, uh, workarounds to such issues, uh, such as the creation of a Chinese wall uh, that would divide the Canadian company and its employees from the Chinese owners, um, those kinds of workarounds, which have worked in the past, are frequently very onerous and, and difficult to structure, uh, and I suspect would be a significant challenge for a Chinese company. A broader national security issue is, however, posed, I think, by the nature of some of ACON's projects, in particular, large infrastructure uh, projects. Uh, one that has already floated in the press uh, is the question of whether a Chinese-owned ACON should be permitted uh, to work on the, pro on the project to build uh, and run the new bridge uh, to the United States from Windsor, uh, particularly in light of uh, the potential for American concerns if it were to be allowed. In the same context, it is hard not to conclude that a range of infrastructure projects from dams to power plants, transmission grids, uh, to communications uh, infrastructure would not raise, would, would, uh, raise, would raise similar national security concerns, as well as in the same, uh, as well as some possibility of an adverse American reaction, given the interconnected uh, nature of our infrastructure and economies. While one might not have the same concerns about all of the projects on which ACON might bid, ACON is, after all, not on, the only, only construction company in Canada, uh, and many projects, uh, even if large, pose no national security risk. It is, not, it is, however, difficult to imagine how one might uh, write an uh, ongoing condition on the, on the acquisition of ACON that would reliably uh, or manage the national security threat. As, as, was, um, as was noted in the press, uh, one could um, as part of the acquisition process, uh, ensure a specific project uh, that, Acon was, that Acon was not allowed to bid on a specific project, but uh, within a, um, uh, but looking forward to future projects, it is hard at this point to define precisely what you would arrange as a limitation on national security that would reliably protect Canadian national security risks going into the future. In that context, it seems to me that it is very difficult for the government uh, to approve the ACON uh, acquisition um, uh, without 
incurring significant risks to national security going forward, and it is therefore hard, it, it would certainly not have been my recommendation to allow it to proceed. Um, having said that, uh, let me digress a little bit, and it's not really perhaps a national security concern explicitly, uh, although it does, I think, have implications ultimately for a broader sense of national security, and that is the issue of, of um, uh, SOEs. Um, and whether it ought to make any difference to uh, the discussion that the acquisition, the acquiring company is a state-owned enterprise uh, rather than a private, private Chinese corporation. To some extent, um, the reality is that it may not make a whole lot of difference um, in the sense that uh, even a private Chinese company uh, is unlikely to be able to resist pressure from the Chinese state in the context of the goals of the Chinese state going forward. Having said that, I do think there is nonetheless a significant uh, problem in looking at corporations, SOEs, SOEs uh, in terms of their ability to acquire Canadian companies. And I think you can indeed argue um, that, in fact, the fact that the acquisition is by an SOE ought, in fact, to make us far more cautious of allowing such a, uh, an acquisition uh, and indeed contributing to, to, the, res to uh, uh, the right decision, which, in my view, ought to be not to permit the acquisition to be made. Um, uh, I would uh, suggest in trying to find um, an appropriate balance for Canada uh, the fact that the acquisition of an SLE uh, uh, does further the, uh, further the balance, in, as I said, in terms of a refusal. Um, if we aspire to a free and transparent marketplace, even if it is likely to be almost always a work in progress, uh, the giant SOEs, Chinese SOEs, it seems to me have no place in our marketplace, or ought to have no place in our marketplace. While some may claim that such SOEs will operate more like, will reform and will operate more like independent private corporations in the future, it is not so long uh, since um, the people made the same arguments about crown corporations in the days when we had more than a few. Um, it, the reality is that there is no secret special recipe uh, that will make Chinese SOEs into something which they are not. It will not make them anything other than an opaque um, entity uh, operated in entirely in accordance with the goals of the state of China. Uh, and in that context, it seems to me, as I said, SOEs, Chinese SOEs have uh, no place in our market and indeed should lead us to conclude um, that, that the acquisition ultimately of ACON should not be permitted to go ahead. Um, with that, trying to keep to my 15 minutes, uh, given that where time is tight, I will uh, leave the floor to the next speaker. Thanks very much, Ward. Uh, next up, uh, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Shuv Majumdar, uh, Monk Senior Fellow here at uh, MLI, who's going to uh, uh, guide the uh, panel discussion, uh, starting, I assume, with Charles Burton, uh, after which there will be questions from the floor. Handing it over to you, Shuv. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here today. This is obviously a subject of extraordinary interest, not our national policy life, but also in the context of the decision before the Canadian Cabinet in the next couple of months. Um, we've seen a lot of discussion in our national news media about the vitality of this particular deal and whether it works for uh, Canada's national interests. And an appropriate debate has ensued. I'm so proud that the McDonnell-Laurie Institute with Dr. Brantley Crowley is contributing, is contributing to that today. 
Uh, I thought it would be appropriate to give my friend Charles here an opportunity to share some of his reflections on what Ward and Duanji have said. Uh, and so, Charles, if you, if you have a few minutes, I'd be very curious to see what you think. Uh, you've written prolifically, both for MLI and in national news media, about what you think the Chinese interests are very specifically. But I'll hand it over to you to, to offer some comments. Uh, thank you very much. I, I mean, clearly, I'm superfluous to this panel, particularly with Leslie Wark over there. And, you know, anyway, I, I think just in general, just to back up what uh, Mr. Elkoff said, you know, the, the state-owned enterprise in China are, in fact, the state. And so they are able to draw on the full resources of the Chinese state, and they're expected to fulfill the mandate of the Chinese, the overall mandate, you know, the whole of government approach or whole of party approach, as it might be in China's case, uh, in, in their operations. So, you know, to give an example, we have the BlackBerry Company. Now, the BlackBerry Company would benefit enormously if they knew more about what sort of new technologies the Samsung Company was producing and what sort of bids the Samsung Company might be making to other telecom companies. Now, I used to work for the communication security establishment. And I don't know, but I imagine it's within the capability of the communication security establishment, you know, using computer trickery, to find out what Samsung's up to and what sort of bids are going on. And in theory, they could provide that to, our com to the BlackBerry company and assist them. But to the best of my knowledge in our system, we don't do that. I, Mr. Elko could correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, we... Uh, <laughs> But China does. There is no question about it. All that cyber espionage that we're picking up on is to serve the interests of the, of the state-owned enterprises. And then with regard to the other side, of course, the state-owned enterprises um, have to do what the state says. It's sort of like, you know, the godfather. You've made me an offer I can't refuse. And so a simple one, um, you know, the, the Le Monde reported that the, uh, that the Chinese construction of the African Union building turned out that it's full of bugs and it's computer server generously provided at a discount by the government of a state firm was sending all the data to Shanghai at regular, ba regular uh, intervals, which incidentally the Chinese foreign ministry called the Le Monde report um, groundless. In terms of our own, um, you know, our own um, political dynamic, uh, you may have seen the article yesterday in the Globe entitled, Why the Acon Sale is a Good Deal for Canada. And it's written by two distinguished former members of government, Mr. Brian Tobin for the Liberals and Mr. Uh, Michael Wilson for the Conservatives. And it turns out that Mr. Tobin is now the chairman of the Acon Board of Governors and vice chair of BMO Capital Markets, one of the financial advisors to Acon. And Mr. Wilson is in Barclays Capital Ca Canada. And they say, while we were both intimately involved in the development of this transaction, we support it not only because it's sound financially, but because we see significant net benefits to Canada from the deal, and this is the sentence that I found was the best, put it another way, if either of us thought this was bad for Canada, we would not be on board. <laughs> so, you know, they, 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 they are Canadians who are unaffected by the possibility that if ACON goes through, they might generate a lot of income. ACON doesn't go through, they'll continue to have the sort of income that I have. Um, <laughs> possibly. Um, and then there is Mr. Howard Ballack. Uh, will Chinese spies sabotage Canadian construction sites? Let's not be silly. Uh, his article in the Financial Post. Uh, I previously worked for Mr. Ballack on my second posting. And he suggests that this would be a good deal, um, saying that preventing Canadian businesses from accessing Chinese capital, a major part of global capital flows, would be somewhere between short-sighted and idiotic. And so Mr. Ballack proposes conditions on the sale, um, such as ensuring there are independent Canadian directors on the board, uh, financial records publicly available, committing to certain levels of local leadership, and so on. Um, but if we look back, you know, and it's only a sample of one, to the cnoc nexon deal that was referred to earlier, at that time, there were also similar commitments. Uh, CNOC committed to maintaining the management um, when the deal came through in February 2013. And by March 2014, the Nexon CEO, Kevin Reinhardt, was fired and a, and a Communist Party official from China came in. And then there was the unfortunate uh, Long Lake pipeline spill, the largest spill in Alberta history. 
um, which came out of a Nexon pipeline, resulting in an investigation to be made as to why the pipeline hadn't been, didn't have the fail-safe measures. That was in July 2015. By January 2016, there was an explosion at Long Lake that killed two. And so the, 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 the challenge, I think, is that once the Chinese state has taken over a company, it becomes very difficult for us to enforce that they should structure their operations in a way differently from the way that they function around the world. Why, why should they? And I mean, one point that uh, Chen Duanjie didn't mention was that until recently, the World Bank had barred the CCCC from bidding on development projects due to corrupt activities. So if I could, you know, the point is that if we bow to the pressure and allow this sale, um, then the Chinese uh, state will have the ability to make unrealistically low bids on projects that might be of interest to the Chinese state from a long-term uh, perspective, and there will be pressure. I mean, I agree with you. Obviously, these things shouldn't be done, but if, if they're bidding low, such as Huawei with you know, our telecommunications, if the bids are very competitive, there's a lot of political pressure uh, to approve those, those bids, and after all, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you know, they, the security review, which has been going through, uh, I heard yesterday, privately, due to the uh, excellent writing of the likes of Mr. Fife over there, um, that will not be made public. If the decision is that we've had a security review and decided there are no concerns, um, we won't know anything about, uh, you know, what was going on in the security review. So I think from that point of view, um, uh, you know, it's a lot of it is about where's the Canadian interest and, and uh, where is the follow the, the money in terms of whether it's possible that as a perhaps a, a naive and trusting people, we are selling our, our, our sovereignty out to a much more sophisticated long range strategy on the part of the People's Republic of China regime. Thank you. <clears throat> I I'd love to. Lucid as ever. Um, I'd love to pick up on your point about uh, what the Chinese interests might be. And Duanjie, I'm going to turn to you in a minute here because you touched upon in your remarks um, Chinese activities in Pakistan, converting Pakistan into a client state in many regards. Um, you talked about port infrastructure in Sri Lanka, which is part of a larger approach across the Indo-Pacific region for China to secure key strategic assets. Um, these are both countries, Sri Lanka and Pakistan, that are having difficult times as emerging democracies. But may I ask you to elaborate a little bit more on established democracies? An analogy that often is used for Canadians uh, is the example of Australia and even New Zealand. Um, you've written extensively on this, and so I was curious, what are your perspectives of how the Chinese experience has been for the Australians or for the people in New Zealand um, in mixing those commercial interests to their SOEs uh, and what, what type of leverage there might be uh, towards their political attitudes and objectives? Go ahead. No, Duanji, this is for you. Um, actually, I'm not uh, so much into politics, but uh, I think I have some fear. What I mean is when China uses its monetary power and when our market system, everyone, is for ourselves, I, I'm not saying selfish in a way. I'm saying we are not sharing the same type of way of thinking. Here, we think about the company's interest, individual freedom, all these kind of things. But in China, they think about the country, the state. So when the state interest is entering our free market system, of course, every firm, every individual, we think about, such as Aquan, what's a big deal? It's good for our company, but we don't think for our country. I don't think we should demand everyone to do that. But my, my fear is, once China's monetary power entering this country, so more and more people may be bought by Chinese money, side with the Chinese government or whatever. So then that actually further disrupted not only our free market system, but our political life like free discussion, because we saw in Australia and New Zealand, Chinese money bought into the political system. And they even robbed some 
New Zealand professor's home and office. So I do have that deep fear. Do we ever dare to say anything, to criticize China, not even criticize, just say like today, what I, all what I said is the fact and the published in Chinese media. So, but here, we don't think that way. So gradually, my fear is, gradually we kind of sided with Chinese way of thinking without knowing it. And our politicians kind of think instant interest, not in the long term. I'm imagining, sometimes I think we should think in an abstractive way. In the long term, if China did realize its dream, become, uh, <laughs> did realize its dream, become the dominant force of the world, do we want to follow their lifestyle? their way of thinking. That's something in my fear. I don't know what I answer no, to your great, question. It's a great yeah. answer. So, Thank you. Yeah. Um, when we look at how sophisticated China is with respect to its Belt and Road Initiative, uh, this multi-trillion dollar initiative to create the physical infrastructure to tie China as a rising and reinvigorated middle kingdom uh, to global opportunity, um, we have to think a lot about what their interests have been in the South China Sea Ward. Um, the island building adventures that China has participated in their um, dredging and reestablishing these military bases uh, has captured great attention, particularly in the U.S. Congress. Uh, a, a friend of mine has suggested that, you know, Marco, Senator Marco Rubio has a bill that has been playing its way through the American Congress uh, from March 2017, actually, but I think it's coming to bear a bit more now in which Chinese companies that were responsible for uh, the construction of the South China Sea bases uh, could be sanctioned by American law. Uh, obviously, one of those kind of companies would be, as Duan Jie had noted earlier, uh, the CCCC, uh, the CCCI, uh, who proudly participated in these things and want to specialize in this technology. Um, to what degree do you think that American legislation ward uh, would impact thinking in Canada um, in how um, this particular deal and this particular transaction would be viewed? Um, uh, to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure that the issue registers, the issue of the South China Sea registers for most Canadians. Um, Fair. Uh, there, there, will, there will always be some who will be conscious of, of the issues and conscious of, of the risks. Um, if the Americans go down that road of passing a bill like that, um, my suspicion is that the, the, the Chinese would regard that as an extremely unfriendly act, um, added on to a few other recent unfriendly acts. <laughs> yes. um, and, and that is likely to, to make, to make a bunch, uh, to raise a bunch of challenges uh, in the next while, particularly if you have lots of money in the stock market. Um, uh, but it's hard for me to believe that that, that will do very much um, something more of a confrontation in the South China Sea, um, which is clearly what the Chinese want. They don't necessarily want a they don't want a confrontation, but they do want to make it clear to the Americans that they cannot operate freely in the South China Sea, that they have the capacity to deny the South China Sea and the Taiwan Straits to, to the Americans, uh, which they see as being in their strategic interest. Uh, but I'm not sure that that really registers for Canadians unless and until somebody fires a missile at a U.S. destroyer or something of that effect. Right, so it's not a popularly understood threat in Canada, in, no. at least in Canadian perception, no. uh, and let alone policymakers. Well, maybe that's something that we can undertake together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Chinese um, interests have used their commercial assets to affect uh, public opinion and engagement in democracies. Uh, in Canada, we've seen a great debate about cash for access and, and, and the revolving door of finance for political influence. Uh, Charles, you've written a lot about this. Um, it, is China just an exceptional case when it comes to their state-owned actors and their political leverage on those state-owned investments in foreign countries? Or are there other countries that you think would fit within the rubric of threat in the broader context of how we look at foreign investment coming into Canada? 
Well, I think certainly, I mean, I, I think there's sort of two questions here. One is the um, Chinese state use of their Chinese Communist Party Central Committee United Front Work Department to try and, and uh, influence the political debate in foreign countries through the use of uh, covert, um, coercive or corrupt activities. And uh, the process can be quite um, su subtle and, and uh, I have been working with a consortium of international scholars including Anne-Marie Brady who had her stuff stolen in New Zealand and scholars in Australia and uh, Czech Republic is another place where the Chinese state has been quite active. Um, United States, of course, France. But, um, you know, the way it, the way it, uh, it, it tends to be uh, acting out is through seeking to influence the political process, uh, through placing um, uh, people in key policy making <coughs> positions who are amenable to the Chinese perspective. And uh, I think maybe it's more advanced in places like um, New Zealand and Australia. Uh, presumably the Chinese state is doing the same things in Canada, we just have not known about it. For example, one major revelation by the Fairfax Media Company was that the former Australian Minister of International Trade who negotiated the free trade deal and was also um, central in the lease of the port of Darwin to a Chinese billionaire and some other um, Chinese exchange projects in um, infrastructural areas, uh, was found to be receiving an 880,000 US dollar a year um, private consultancy from the same billionaire. Well, there's nothing illegal here. Um, you know, he's a former minister. Obviously, his private consulting is extremely good. $880,000 a year's worth, and we don't even know what he does. Um, but, you know, one does wonder if policymakers in countries um, don't offend the Chinese government or engage in, in um, some policy decisions that the Chinese government would favor, would it be that after retirement they would start to have opportunities in Chinese state-connected uh, money-making things? Uh, um, you know, not to speak of the, the politician in New Zealand who uh, a member of parliament of New Zealand who was on the Foreign Affairs Committee and Defense Committee who emigrated to New Zealand age 32 having falsified his immigration application to hide the fact that he had just prior to immigration been employed in a military intelligence institute. Well, this, this uh, Anne-Marie Brady um, put out the paper, uh, we were at a conference in Washington in the fall, she put out the paper with this information in it just prior to the New Zealand election. It had no impact on the election. Um, turns out the man was re-elected and may well continue to, to be in those committees because evidently the other parties also um, uh, don't think that this is an issue that should be of concern. Well, you know, there's no, it's, it's really speculation innuendo we don't have any, any smoking gun in the sense that we don't have any recording where a Chinese person says, you know, if you vote this way in Parliament, uh, we'll be sure to give you that. And so to what extent it exists, uh, it seems to be a lot of smoke, but uh, we don't have any fire. <clears throat> it's a fascinating point. Um, if I could, just as a, as a, as just a, as a uh, what do you call it? A, 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 a revealing point. I'm currently being sued by Michael Chan of the government of Ontario with regard to a, a piece called The Murky World of Chinese Influence that I published in the Global Mail in 2015. Um, the thing, the, the lawsuit dies in 2020, but currently I am in fact subject to, to a lawsuit over suggesting that, you know, ceases his interest in Mr. Chan was something that we should pay more attention to. I appreciate you for disclosing that and sympathize with your predicament. Um, I, I have full insurance, so I, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> You're enjoying I, the game. <laughs> I'm not going to lose the house. Uh, <laughs> uh, when it comes to non-Chinese state-owned enterprises, because there are an array of those, um, how can Canadian policy leaders, and I, I put this to the panel at large, uh, perhaps, Ward, I'll start with you, when it comes to discerning Chinese state-owned investment versus non-Chinese state-owned investment, um, do we believe that non-SOEs from China truly have agency in their investments abroad? 
Is it something that is assured in how President Xi has been approaching uh, the, the, the question of power in his own country? Um, and is there, is there opportunity for openness for engagement with that particular community? Um, not sure I quite understand where you're going. Um, but I think the reality is that any, any state enterprise uh, ultimately works for the state mm -hmm. uh, and, and will, will obey the diktats of the state uh, within. Yeah. Let, let me clarify a bit, because in, in the non-state-owned enterprise community in China, they're always subject to being able to be taken over down the road. Yeah. Um, and how much confidence do we have that that well, particular sector could Okay, you're, okay. So. Yeah. Um, uh, the reality is that uh, when you think about it, uh, the, the reality is that virtually any Chinese company will abide by the diktats of the state. I mean, the reality is Huawei is not a state-owned enterprise, uh, but it is, uh, I've been quoted on a number of occasions as, as saying that it's it, passing strange to me that we would allow Huawei to build uh, communications infrastructure in, in Canada. Right. Um, uh, and certainly the, the, the idea that we would allow them into sensitive uh, fields would, would puzzle me. Uh, so a, a private corporation is not necessarily uh, a guarantee that we're not going to have a problem with the Chinese. I think the issue is a question of balance. I mean, we have a choice. We could say we're not going to deal with China at all. Uh, but that seems to me, in the scheme of things, uh, the previous government sort of went down that road for a while, and some parts of the previous government went down that road. I'm not sure that was entirely wise. Um, uh, that said, clearly we need to exercise more caution than I think the current government is, is necessarily exercising, which means we need to look at it, look at all of them more carefully, whether they're SOEs or private Chinese companies, uh, because no chi private Chinese company is that private. Fair enough. If I could just supplement, I mean, if you look at the organogram of Huawei or all those companies, they well, come Huawei as part has, of, some, has a few little, there are a few little hinky things in Huawei's background. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, that too. But yeah. they have the Communist Party branch at the top. So the, if you look at the pyramid, the top guy is the party, the board of directors and so on is further down. And of course, in Huawei, only Chinese nationals are allowed to have shares in that company, which is... I don't understand that at all. But anyway, uh, I'd, I'd love to invest. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it, it, I think anything that has the Chinese Communist Party branch at the top of their mm -hmm. organogram, one can assume that it's responding to the party state. And I don't think you find any companies of any size in China that don't have that distinctive character in their management structure. It, it, it does. It does it, the only thing it may do is it may change the bargaining power we have with, a, with one of those companies vis-a-vis -vis an SOE. Uh, the balance may be a little bit different. Is that something we need to explore? Because if it indeed is not a Chinese-owned, state-owned company, they at least don't have their they don't have their name on the on the on the faceplate, so right, to speak. Right. Uh, so at the, at the end of the day, Chinese national interests are not necessarily tied to the success or failure of that company. Fair enough. Uh, so we may be able, in fact, to to regulate that company more actively and effectively than we might an SOE. I, I don't know how you regulate a Chinese SOE in Canada, operating in Canada. I mean, it's virtually impossible to do. Thoughts on that? I like uh, your point about actually is not about the SOE versus Chinese private companies. Instead, it's how to deal with China. So that's the, because private companies, they may start it as a private company, but ultimately they have to listen to the party. They cannot do anything the party does not approve. So my sense is that if the private companies, like taking over any company, Canadian ones, if the, China, the government does not approve, then they can't do it. But if the government didn't say anything, means they can go ahead. Does that mean a threat or danger? I cannot say. But ultimately, if they do anything here the government doesn't like, so they will say, switch your track, do this. So how do we deal with it? So my point is always like, because a few years back when I wrote that paper about the Nixon, um, no, uh, CNOC Nixon deal, at the time, actually, I didn't have any um, 
political sense or whatever, I just feel like so worried about our free market system. And at the time, the European countries, especially UK, they were so open, like try to get ahead of everyone else to get the Chinese money, the Chinese deal. So there was at a conference, there was someone saying, we should learn from UK. So because at the time, Australia already felt vigilant, something went wrong. But the people were, so what I'm saying is the Western world, do we see our market system under threat? If that's the way, we still want our open market system, but then we are not for sale. So I think these countries need to bond together instead right. of like try to compete with each other individually, or oh, what's our China stra strategy? Instead, I mean, this TPP, unfortunately, Trump, like, uh, like, what should I say, drop off. But then that's one model we should like follow, strengthen, and go ahead from there, keep developing it. Just like recent, there was a report about, I think it's a Harvard Business School, or there was someone write a paper, why the countries need to strengthen the WTO's rule about transparency. Because before China joined, no one knew there would be such a, a development, right? But now things changed. We should up, upgrade our rules to, I don't know what this word is correct, contain China's violation of the, this world global order. I, th I, think, I think that's right. I mean, I think the reality is your, your point that it, it can't be us alone. Right. I mean, we do need to have a position vis-a-vis -vis China, its SOEs, its acquisitions in Canada, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the reality is it cannot be Canada on its own. It, it, it has to be a policy that we share with others. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, um, we're not going to be very successful with it. Well, it strikes me that um, the quality of the state that owns the enterprise is a key determinant in deciding how either Canada or the world could engage a policy on state-owned investment. Uh, I say this because I'm curious, are there states, state-owned enterprises that are not Chinese that would be welcome in the Canadian marketplace? Well, think of Petronas. Petronas, exactly right. Amongst others? Well, I mean, you know, where I come from, Niagara, we're not happy with U.S. Steel. They didn't fulfill what we expected. I mean, they're a big company, and once they own it, you know, it's very hard to hold them to the conditions because, you know, as a case with... But with U.S. Steel is not a, not a state-owned enterprise. That's like, true. Like yeah. Petronas is. But it's Stato. big. Stato. 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 Yeah. But I, I think in general, if you look at China and, and their enterprises, you know, I don't think any country maintains the WTO agreement perfectly. You know, everybody interprets to favor their own interest. It's just that the space for interpretation is sort of an accepted kind of space that we operate in as you know, liberal, in a liberal world. But the Chinese uh, state continues to push that space outwards. And so they're not prepared to accept the, the, the rules of our game. And that's why, as Chen Banjie had said, um, you know, they want to establish this community of the common destiny of humankind. In other words, which Mr. Xi says is a new form of international relations and the People's Daily said is superior to other international relations. In other words, they don't believe in liberal democracy. Explicitly, they don't believe in it. And they want to establish a new form of, of international order based on China as the hegemon and the rest of us, you know, to, to our benefit according to the Chinese government, <laughs> going along with that. So from, from that point of view, uh, you know, it's unrealistic, I think, now, even though for many years I'd hoped it would be otherwise, to expect China to become into compliance with the accepted norms of, of global governance and, and international behavior um, economically, unless, as you say, we're able to actually get a court. Well, for one thing, we need to put a lot more resources into trying to suss this out properly. And I, I think particularly with intelligence, probably a lot of large proportion of the resources go into counterterrorism and not into how to keep up with the latest developments on what the Chinese state is thinking of. And the other is to find like-minded countries and try and come up with you know, some general principles that would allow us to have a coordinated 
reasonable response to what's okay and what's not okay, because obviously we cannot not deal with what may be the largest economic force on the planet in years ahead, but maybe it's preferable to not deal with them than to deal with them in a way that will end up having bad impacts on Canada overall. So then very briefly, and I'd like to turn to the audience soon for questions, so if you have some, please think about it. Uh, and I'd like to call on a few at a time uh, so that we have an opportunity for our esteemed panelists to respond. <clears throat> the current um, trade challenge posed by Washington to Beijing, directly and bluntly, um, whether it's on microchips or on credit reserve, is it a good thing for world order for this, to, for this reckoning to happen, or is it a bad thing? I think, I mean, I don't think it's just about trade. It's really about, you know, China's dissembling and dishonesty in, in all sorts of areas, including the South China Sea and just everything. I think the Trump regime really wants to be dealing with a different kind of China, and they're trying to use this, the trade dispute over things like international property and the protection of proprietary manufacturing processes and non-tariff barriers and imposition of arbitrary taxes and all of these things that inhibit access to the market to try and deal with this much larger question of can we come up with some common basis for a fair and reciprocal kind of uh, interaction. And incidentally, the prospect of Canada having reciprocal access to China to buy a construction company, I mean, that's not happening. So, so you know, I, 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 my general impression is that the people in the Trump government really have a much larger agenda than simply an accelerating, we'll tariff you more and you'll tariff us more until eventually the Chinese squeak. You have more faith than I do. But... <laughs> you're, you're more suspicious? Uh, it, I mean, I, th there are a lot of people trying to put a strategy around the president's words. Whether that's a real strategy or just cacophony is another question. Fair point. Wanjie, do, do you have views about the Trump administration uh, yeah. in China? <laughs> do you want to wade into this? <laughs> um, I don't have much to say, but I, I like to see, because when I saw the reaction by recent um, Xi Jinping said something strike a kind of uh, nice tone, if I could say it this way. I think regardless of what's in Trump's mind, at least his tough stand seems to have some impact. That's what I saw. I'm not thinking. It's very hard to separate actions from rhetoric with this particular administration in Washington. I'll give you that. I'd like to turn to the audience now. Um, and if you have a question, please raise your hand. Uh, I'll call on a few of you. I ask you to keep it terse uh, and to the point. And if you don't, I will call you out. So I will start with you, sir, at the back of the room. Uh, please say who you are and Hi. offer a question. My name is Tobias Fisher. Sorry. My name is Tobias Fisher. I just have uh, two questions. One, uh, is the current government, including the political leadership, or in particular the political leadership, aware of these issues and problems, or sufficiently aware of these concerns that you've all raised today? And secondly, if they reject the ICON bid, what are the consequences for the Canadian economy and foreign direct investment? We've seen foreign direct investment fall off the cliff uh, here in the last few years. So what are the consequences if the government rejects this bid on security? Thank you. Uh, sir? Yeah, and David Kilgore. Peter Monaro has, um, has run for the Democrats, I think, four times in California. He switched to Trump. And he makes the point in a book I hope a lot of you have read called Death by China that something like 54,000 manufacturing plants in the United States have closed, largely because of jobs being outsourced to China, and about 23 million Americans lost their jobs in manufacturing plants. So if politicians are elected, and yourself here, I'm happy to say, are elected to help our people, all of the things that have been said uh, unsympathetic to China's state of remaining crisis today should, I think, sink in all of our heads and we should act accordingly. Thank you for your comment. <clears throat> Sir. Uh, my name is Samir Javed. Uh, my question is in terms of, uh, you said we need to pursue, China's pursuing soft power. Uh, a lot of these deals are also done for the sake of foreign policy. Uh, would you, could you comment on foreign aid, the way China does foreign aid as foreign policy? A big example of that being building uh, soccer stadiums in different countries at a concession price and so furthering their um, manufacturing and 
uh, building exports to Africa, South, uh, South America, Latin America, and other countries. So how do we, how do we understand foreign aid as foreign policy when it comes to China? Very good. One more question. Sir. My name is Roy Atkinson. I'd like to ask a question to Roy Alcock. You said you said that it was unlikely that the government could control or regulate uh, an SOE. I want you to unpack that a bit, because I'm thinking about uh, importing Chinese labor, how we manage that, environmental standards, uh, the whole raft of laws and regulations. Where, where does it come unstuck? Where, where are the, sure, to some of them, we live up to, where are the parts that we probably can't? Thank you very much. So to summarize, <clears throat> is the government presently, the senior officials, uh, the political leaders, are, are they sufficiently aware of the risks uh, pertaining to the ACON deal? What would be the consequences of rejecting this deal? Um, how does China pursue its soft power, uh, particularly through projects like soccer stadiums? Um, and then unpack exactly what it means to try and regulate a Chinese SOE. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll offer it, the floor to anybody who wishes to try and take a stab at any of those questions, uh, and then we'll go on from there. I think, uh, you know, when the uh, CNOC Nexon uh, went through in a way where the government said that they would agree to uh, the $15 billion acquisition of Nexon, but would not agree to Chinese state um, majority ownership of companies, uh, I got a, a, a late night telephone call from a senior official of a certain Canadian bank who sounded to me as if he may have consumed some alcohol, <laughs> and he was quite loud. I, I, you know, I'd been, I'd, I'd been talking about this at various forums, and he suggested to me, you know, you've just cost us $200 billion worth of potential Chinese investment. So, <laughs> well, you know, that $200 billion is a lot of money. So, I mean, I think, you know, there's no question that if we, if we agree that China has the, the resources and we could benefit richly from you know, allowing unfettered Chinese state access to our, to our economy, and this would engender uh, many uh, jobs and developmental opportunities. So, you know, it, it, uh, the, the, the $200 billion is, is unfortunate. Uh, I think, um, just briefly on the other one, if China's foreign aid, foreign policy, oh, the other question says, does the government know? I don't, it's hard to know uh, what, say, Gerald Butts knows, um, but my feeling is that you know, there are so many voices that speak to government, um, uh, particularly security people and, and maybe some uh, foreign affairs people who might have different interests, but I think the voices that speak the loudest tend to be uh, the business voices, and I'm, I'm inclined to think that to a large extent the government hopes to manage the, the voices that are not supportive of Chinese state investment in Canada, and, you know, and because they're, they're political supporters and, and themselves, you know, are part of an elite class that, that would be potentially rewarded by, um, by this activity. So I, I don't think they want, they, perhaps they don't want to know. Um, in terms of the foreign aid, uh, you know, I think China's done some wonderful things uh, in terms of developing infrastructure. I, I, I think the jury is still out as to whether the Chinese are worse in Africa than the colonial powers were. Um, you know, we don't really know. And certainly a lot of my African friends have a lot of concern about Chinese behavior there in terms of their commitments to environmental protection and so on. And then we do have this disturbing um, tendency of uh, China to give loans to African countries which are unable to be returned that the Chinese then um, ask for um, you know, ownership of, of uh, port facilities or other key um, infrastructural elements in because they're unable to repay the loan. I, I know of a couple of cases, one of them being Sri Lanka in that regard. So, um, you know, I don't think that China proceeds from a missionary um, stance towards foreign aid as perhaps we did when so much of CETA was, in fact. Many of them were foreign missionaries. Um, they, but, you know, I, I am concerned about the idea that perhaps the use of loans to achieve Chinese government objectives could be to the disadvantage of those countries and lead to an expansion of China's strategic reach in places where previously they did not have that. I, I, I mean, having visited more than a few African countries, um, it's not hard to see the foreign aid. Uh, it's there, it's not just soccer stadiums, it's government buildings, it's legislative buildings, it's 
uh, a whole lot of things, um, some of them fairly crudely built um, in some places. But, but they are there. I think the bigger thing for, for most African countries, though, is that Chinese aid tends to come without the strings in the sense that it tends to come without criticism of, of what governments do uh, in, in certain places. Uh, and, and that makes it much more popular. Um, I've talked to some Africans who think very highly of their aid, uh, even military aid. I've talked to others who, as you said, have, have concerns. So I think it's a mixed bag uh, as to whether or not it will be successful. The, the jury, I think, is still out. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Regulating SOEs in Canada. Uh, regulating SOEs. I mean, the, the problem with reg regulating SOEs is how do you write or can you enforce your rules around, you can, the, the rules are still going to be there, whatever the rules were, uh, and arguably we can continue to enforce them against any specific SOE just as we would any other country, any other company. Um, but the reality is you're now dealing with a country. Uh, and so if, if they find the regulations inconvenient, they have a whole lot more clout in, in seeking to persuade you to change the rules, uh, to amend the rules. Uh, so how will you be able to stick to all your rules? Uh, and the fact that, that, that Canadians may want you to stick to the rules may not work if, if jobs are suddenly going to go away because we're going to leave town because you haven't rewritten the rules. So the, it, it does change, I think with an SOE, uh, it does arguably change the rules and the capacity of the Canadian state to regulate as effectively as it would with a private corporation or a Canadian corporation. Uh, so uh, I may be overstating it to say can't regulate them, but I'm not sure we can do it with the certainty that we would do uh, for a Canadian corporation uh, operating today. And to Tobias's question about um, the men and women who staff government at the senior most levels have access oh, to information. They know. They, they certainly have access. The issue is rarely whether people have access, it's whether they want to listen or not. Um, and and that, that tends to happen regardless of which party happens to be in power, uh, on, usually on different things, but it does happen. Um, uh, there is, I mean, the previous government had, uh, there were a, a number of people who were very opposed to doing anything with China. Um, I recall. <laughs> yeah, you recall. Um, in the current government, there are probably some who, who without naming names, are, are probably slightly naive on the subject of China. And it's, it's not because they don't know anything about China. I think it's because, because China is a very impressive, to visit it, to see what they have achieved, or even to, to read about what they have achieved, it's an enormous achievement. It is an impressive achievement. Uh, uh, and it's not entirely surprising that some people are seduced by the magnificence. Fair enough. I mean, it, it is the new Rome. It is an excellent point. <laughs> we know what happened to Rome. Yes. Well, under uh, crushing oh debt. Yeah. <laughs> Rome, huh? um, I'd like to pick up the question uh, that gentleman asked whether the government know. I don't know whether the government, our government knows all this fact, but I like to think we do need to spend, um, to make some effort to understand the China in depth not just the China, this glory, glory picture on the world. Actually, in China, there are a lot of poor people. They can't afford to go to the hospital to have the medical care. Uh, I look at their uh, year 2017 budget, spending budget, like defense was over 30%. Of course, this is central government budget. I cannot say I understand everything about local. and. Um, and the, the public safety is mainly about the suppression or whatever censorship that account for almost 10%. Mm -hmm. But instead, in contrast, the social security is under 5%. So you can imagine how Chinese government spent this money. Now, back to your point of whether our government knows, I don't know, but when I read this in Chinese, I always felt, could our government have a, not an army, a small group of people really focus on truly understand China instead of just seeing 
what's reported, what they want to show to the world. And what I said today is nothing secret. It's from a claimed SASAC report about CCCC. They were so proud of saying all these things. <laughs> you, you would think it's strange. I have some anecdotes, stories, like I'm in Washington, D.C. Sometimes I attend this GW event. So you all know that um, famous scholar, David Shambaugh, mm -hmm. wrote about, he said his other passion was Brazil. So he went to Brazil into a domestic like flight. He said uh, someone sat beside him, dress as a Chinese, dressed smartly, and uh, after they had a few exchanges, because Shemba, David Shemba speaks Chinese, so he was, do you know what? We built those island. Mm -hmm. So like really proudly review that. It's not, they don't hide. What I'm saying is they don't share our way of thinking. So that's the problem. So think about the think tank here has to be funded by private citizens or companies or whatever. We don't really have government kind of think tank. We see that's wrong. And, but in China, there's no private think tank. There was a one established, the very first one, ultimately two years ago was shut down completely. And at the time, when I was at the University of Calgary, that SOE uh, conference, I proposed I suggested uh, invite their um, CEO or whatever. And uh, he came. At the time, I quietly asked him. I said, aren't you afraid when you voice the different opinion the government doesn't like? He said, actually, we provide a lot of ideas. They use our ideas as a kind of different opinion. But uh, like uh, at the time, they still kind of want to reform. But now they were told this think tank, the only private think tank, was totally shut down. So whatever the government does in the, at the university, their research team, I was told, like a tube, like you do this, you do that, then quickly assembled the result. A big report, always like a, a collective report. So. What I'm saying is, do we want to share the China model? If we don't, how do we deal with it? So if the government doesn't want to put resources to really obtain an in-depth understanding of China, then we are going nowhere in terms of a policy direction. And that's another, it's not an extort. It's a real story. I have a very, one time very, close girlfriend who was trained in the States. Now she is a very kind of prominent professor in Beijing University. She has a public speech saying, China, our new contribution to the mankind is a China model. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that? No. I mean, I, I haven't been speaking <laughs> with her for a long time. <laughs> It's not about I knew he, she would go that direction just because we were apart to pursue different <laughs> personal dream she wants to be, to contribute to the country maybe. I don't know, I'm not criticizing her. But when she said that, I was shocked because that's why I think more in long term, in strategic sense. Do we want to share the China model or do we want to preserve our own way of life? Where we came from, who we are, that's an old ancient mm -hmm. question, where we are going. So that's what I'm thinking our government should take care of. Interestingly. So, just to please. go back on one thing that, that I didn't want to, to hit was uh, the issue of, of the consequences of not approving a crime. Ah. I mean, I, I think the reality is to imagine that there will not be a fairly sharp reaction from China yeah. is, is probably unwise. And that there would be a sharp reaction. There will be a sharp reaction. Do we know uh, what it looks like? No, I don't think we know what would it looks like. Would it be a like. cyber attack? No, <laughs> no. I, no, I don't, th I don't think that, but I, I don't think that. But I think that uh, we could find ourselves uh, in a, 
think of uh, there, there being instances in the past, for example, of tourism and so on, all of a sudden you, know, you have no Chinese tourists coming to Canada or going to whatever country it is. They have ways, what happened to that, that South Korean company right. when, when they, they got upset with the South Koreans. The Chinese have ways of administering punishment. They don't have to use cyber attacks to do it. Rare, um, rare earth export ban. The rare earth yeah, export yeah. ban, indeed. I yes. could just say one thing about this. You know, it's not, I mean, the China model is not all Chinese people. You, you no. Know? I mean, they, no. there's a lot of diverse thinking. And I, I went to university in China and have a lot of contact with my former classmates. And, um, you know, they're not, they, they believe in, in, in the values of citizenship and, and, and freedom. It's not that, that, you know, it's the Chinese Communist Party's current leadership. I, I, like you, I, you know, one of my close friends from university is now a member of the Standing Committee of the Politburo. Uh, Wang Huning, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he, uh, he's done well in the regime. Who am I to, you know, who am I to, uh, to, to condemn? But, but what he actually thinks personally, you know, or what he could well, potentially that's the think, problem. it's not, I don't think we ought to define it as China. It's, it's a certain regime of China, has a certain interpretation of Chinese history and culture that leads to a self-justifying model for, or as you say, to redress the the, the humiliation of the Opium War and create world dominance. But yeah, that's why it could I, be different, you know, it could be different. That's why I said that we need to understand their thinking. Yeah. And the, what they want to do could be very silly. To me, I always felt China model is destroying their country, their economy, and the hurtful to their people. Because so many people, they, we saw a lot of Chinese tourists spend big money here and the what all, all over the world. I just came back from Turkey. Like no one, not no one, very few Westerners now wants to tour Turkey, but Chinese were over everywhere. So I mean, but still, because such a big base, 1.3 or 4 billion people. So whoever we saw in the foreign land, still a very small portion. And before, I didn't understand why they came out to just the want to shop. And now I understand better because there are so many Chinese articles saying how expensive in China buying the same thing made in China, but more expensive in China. So that's how the government collect money, because the due, uh, I mean the tariff, we are now talking, criticizing about Trump. I'm not siding with him, but you just think the cars, same car here is how much there could triple. So that's how government gather the money. You say <coughs> China is wealthy, tri uh, rich, it's government can controlled monetary power. So they use the money freely in the foreign country, poor country, they can build whatever stand, stadium. 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 Yeah, stadium. Yeah. And then their own people, they don't care. They don't take care of them. So what country is this? I'm not saying anti whoever, but I just care about the people because I came from there. I lived in the countryside during the Cultural Revolution. So I know how hard that life is. So that's kind of... The Chinese stuff in the dollar store in St. Catharines is a lot cheaper than the same stuff bought in China. It seems almost unbelievable to imagine. <laughs> well, listen, there's um, a twin threat to Canadian sovereignty and Canadian freedom of debate. One is that of foreign disruption, as we've discussed today on the panel, and the other is sometimes uh, the China model being replicated in the government of Canada. The happy talk being funded by taxpayer money because the government feels like the people are not educated enough about the, Can the Chinese opportunity. I think that's a, that's a double-edged sword when it comes to um, you know, proponents of why Canada should have a better relationship with China, uh, even if they're naively informed at the outset. It's a, it's a concern in how the government treats its own people here. Uh, and, and I think questions exactly our very sense of identity, Duanjie, identity, Duanjie, that you had mentioned. Uh, I'm going to come back to the room for more questions. Uh, I'll start over here. Go ahead, Fred. Is there any hope for the Conservative Party of Canada? Because it seems split between the Bernie liber uh, libertarians who criticize Trudeau in the leadership campaign for not going fast enough on free trade, and perhaps the Jason Kenney wing, who uh, really understands what China's all about. Okay, good question, sir. Yes. Oh, we'll do both of you. Well, One of you start. Oh, no, no, you're up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just want to tell you uh, that uh, 
when the, you said that the people uh, said that China modernist, uh, I'm not surprised at all because correct me, but the meaning of China is empire of the middle. And the China always considered themselves to be superior to the other people. And that's why the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century was pretty hard on the Chinese people because they were constantly defeated, invaded, and, and, and so, so I'm not surprised at how the attitude uh, that it's part of their, uh, the, the Stalinist just pick so up that line. The question, sir? And uh, you can use it. And What's the question? Yeah, and that's, a, that's, a that's the comment. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for a most informative conversation, and thanks to the Institute for arranging it. Uh, many years ago, I was asked my views on the subject, how does Canada deal with China? And I said, well, we can't ignore them. You can't do without them, because it's clear they're, I mean, even then, they were a rising power in the world. On the other hand, it's going to be very difficult to live with them and to deal with them. Fortunately, nobody asked me, how do we deal with them? And uh, so I'd like to see if we can <laughs> come up with some general thank you for coming. I mean, we've got a lot on this particular uh, potential purchase and so forth. So on that issue, we've heard a lot. Are there some general guidelines that you can come up with for Canada's dealings with the China uh, that we see emerging, and in particular, once you have that, and we've heard one, invest in knowledge. A professor can say no to that. So, yes, investing in knowledge, I would think, is, is the first guideline. But after that, are there some guidelines you can give us for dealing with China effectively? And once you have those, can you apply it to the next big question coming up? What about a free trade pact? Thank you. Sir? David Harris, I'm uh, interested in reinforcing the expression of concern about the subversion of responsible free speech about exactly the kinds of issues you've been raising. We've heard about lawfare, the use of uh, lawsuits to uh, stifle reasonable discussion. But there are other means as well, and we have heard how in New Zealand there's been, uh, at least in one case, an effort to steal material in Ottawa. I personally know of a situation where someone who is extremely intimately connected to Parliament and to those raising criticism about China had their apartment broken into. And the indications and evidence strongly suggested that this may have been a Chinese embassy related issue. A police officer, an officer on the scene said, oh yes, the Chinese are doing this throughout Ottawa now. So one of the difficult issues is that if we should find this kind of thing propagating itself among us. How do we actually ensure that we get the kind of discussion in an open way that we really so desperately need? And relating to this, the second aspect, we bring in, of course, a huge number of people through our immigration streams, uh, overall about 2.5 times the number of people brought in per capita in the United States. Chinese immigration has been increasing vastly, and Many people from China have said to me that they're very concerned about the leverage that this can give the Chinese regime. The way it's almost analogous to some of the SOEs that are coming into the country. I'd be interested in reflections upon these uh, aspects. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Sorry. A very short one. Would, would it help us all if we were to change the rules of investment that no country can invest in another country? more than 40% of the equity of our country. If we do it worldwide, mm -hmm. would, it, would it help solve that? Thank you. All right, so I think we have a good suite of questions here. I'll try and summarize very briefly. One was a comment, perhaps more about the Conservative Party, which may not be the most appropriate question to place uh, to this panel, but they're obviously welcome to respond. Um, the idea of a middle empire rising, uh, how should Canada deal with the question of China more broadly, uh, and if so, wither free trade at any point? Is that something even worth exploring? Uh, the nature of how China deploys its power, whether through lawfare, as our friend Charles has experienced, uh, or uh, even through immigration, uh, is that something that we should be concerned about 
in terms of how China might try and leverage its influence in Canada and Canadian life. And then finally, the rules of investment itself, the subject of this very panel, uh, in terms of should it be regulated at 40% or less, or is there a, is there a policy approach to in, ne negating the, the corrosive impact of state-owned enterprises? I'll put it to the panel now and see whoever wants to jump into this first. Why don't we start with you then? Just, um, uh, you know, with regard to the uh, Conservative Party, I, I, you know, I think it's regrettable if an important foreign policy issue with enormous implications for Canada's long-range future becomes the subject of partisan, mm -hmm. par you know, back and forth. And, and I think that within the cabinet of both the recent governments, there has been a split, in, to my understanding, of people who have one perspective or the other. And perhaps with the Liberals, there's a bit more of the, uh, you know, the most important thing in Canada's relations with China is our economic benefit and all the rest should be subverted to that. And perhaps in the Conservatives, there was a bit more about we should be concerned about Canadian values. But I don't, you know, when you compare, like for someone who studies the Chinese Communist Party, the differences between the Liberals, Conservatives, and the NDP are, don't seem that great. Um, you know, we have a common basis of values that we share. And, essentially whichever government would become the government of Canada, one would expect that the same principles would generally inform how we engage with a country like China. But I am concerned about, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the association of um, government people with think tanks that receive Chinese government funding, the Public Policy Forum, which is, you know, and the other documents that came out prior to the Trudeau government coming in, that suggested that Canadian public opinion should be uh, um, brought round to the idea of how important it is that, that we engage with China economically and therefore we should, we should uh, you know, not be so concerned about other issues that are currently of large concern to Canadians. I, and just to briefly uh, conclude, I, I think that what I would like to do, and perhaps I, uh, I, I'm a very naive uh, scholar, but I would like us to uh, be honest in our relations with China and tell the truth. So I don't think that we should, um, you know, abandon our own um, um, principles that we adopt in our relations elsewhere with regard to China. So this would suggest, uh, should we refuse to see the Dalai Lama because the Chinese government has threatened consequences if we do so? Uh, should we speak out on uh, Hong Kong when Canada also signed the, uh, the joint declaration when it was, uh, when it was uh, given to the UN? Um, what about Taiwan? Should we continue to follow the Chinese um, guidance on that? Uh, we um, initially agreed uh, that the, the International Court of Arbitration in The Hague was a legitimate body for assessing disputes of the law of the sea. And since then, we've been pretty quiet about, uh, you know, what's going on there. Um, what about, um, you know, this matter of uh, Chinese security agents who illegally enter Canada under false pretenses to harass Canadians of Chinese origin? I asked the RCMP about this, uh, and they explained to me that, yes, as soon as they find out that such a person is here, they send them back to China right away. Well, you know, no, no, no accountability, no consequences. I, I feel that something about this is, should be open. Uh, what about um, the Magnitsky Law? You know, we have, un, we have recent information from Amy Chang, John Chang's uh, daughter, that her father is not in good condition in prison. A Canadian citizen who has been imprisoned in China for a customs dispute of a murky nature for a very long time. Um, you know, to what extent should Canada be uh, uh, you know, bringing this up and, and, and making something out of it, or other Canadians who we feel have been denied um, due process of law. Should we not, if we're going to identify Magnitsky cases for other countries, surely there are many Chinese officials who would also fall under the same criteria if they were applied equally. So, you know, there are many, there are many, uh, there are many issues under which we could be saying, um, you know, look, uh, this, is, this is where we stand and if China doesn't, isn't prepared to accept, uh, you know, wants to sanction us in other areas, then perhaps we have to accept that sanction. Of course, this would be much more effective if we could get a common ground with other countries, but you know, it's sort of a prisoner's dilemma game, isn't it? Uh, with regard to free trade, I love free trade, uh, as long as it's fully reciprocal and transparent. Pretty simple. That was a tour de force, thank you for that. Um, it's, it's hard to see free trade as being reciprocal. 
Uh, so it, it, it doesn't seem to me that a free trade agreement with China is on the immediate horizon. Uh, it, is, it, it is interesting that the Chinese seem to be almost more interested in it than we are. Um, but um, uh, I'm not sure it's going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, I, think, I think everybody senses that there's a certain amount of resistance and this is probably not the time. Um, a 40% rule, um, I'm not an economist, I'm a lawyer. Uh, so what that, that would entail, uh, what that, whether that would work or not, I, have, I frankly have no idea, although my suspicion is that, that those kinds of restrictions inevitably uh, damage economies, ultimately. Uh, ultimately interfere with free trade uh, and the development of economies. And so it, to me, it does not on its face make sense, but an economist might tell me I'm totally wrong, so uh, I, I should not go any further than that. Um, conservative party, um, I love all conservative, all parties, um, <laughs> equally. <laughs> Um, but I'm a, I'm a bureaucrat, I've only been retired for two years, and I still am still probably uh, infected with, uh, with being a bureaucrat, so, so I won't comment uh, on, on anything partisan. Um, so what else would we have there? Uh, uh, I think you covered it. Um, yeah. Immigration. Immigration. Um, Actually, the interesting one of the interesting things that the Actually, other day. May, may I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. This is such a sensitive conversation to have because anybody who usually talks about Chinese immigration to Canada gets accused of racism, which is absolutely not the actual argument. And whenever people talk about Chinese investment in Canada beyond the state, individual investment in real estate markets like Vancouver or Toronto, we don't have the capacity to talk about it because we feel like there's this allegation of racism that might be part of the conversation. So I want to absolve you of that entirely because I think it's a very legitimate question to be asking in terms of how the Chinese state deploys people and capital through individual people to realize its soft power ambitions. So, so please be brave in how you respond to this. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I'm sure it takes great comfort. Actually, I'm going to I'm going to have to I'm going to have to uh, figuratively plead the fifth on that one because <laughs> I'm, I'm still covered by the access to uh, the Security of Information Act. Right. Um, so whatever I know is still secret. Um, uh, but I'll come back to foreign interference in a second. Uh, the issue of immigration is is an interesting one. Uh, actually, one of the things that I note, noted the other day, uh, which surprised me, is that China is no longer the largest uh, contributor of immigration to Canada. It is, in fact, the Philippines. The Philippines. Yeah. By quite a large margin. That's so um, the, the, the makeup of immigration has changed fairly considerably in the last little while. Very good. Um, so whether that, whether that speaks to the issue of, of Chinese coming to Canada. The foreign interference issue, uh, China is neither the first nor the only country um, that, that questions have arisen with respect to foreign interference, uh, which is part of uh, the jurisdiction of the service, uh, Canadian Security Intelligence Service. Um, uh, it surprises me that anybody in the Ottawa Police Force would, would say that the Chinese do this regularly. Um, I can't speak to that. Um, um, but there are a large number of countries that have over the years um, indulged in interference in Canadian populations. Uh, to give you an example of how extreme it can be, go back to the Air India incident which many people at the time believed was, uh, in fact, the activities of, of RAW in Canada. It was not. It was, in fact, uh, Babar Khalsa members. Mm -hmm. uh, but nonetheless, uh, it's not the first time that allegations have been made about uh, foreign interference in Canada, and it will not be the last. Um, both the service uh, and the RCMP uh, spend a lot of time on those issues. You're not wrong to point out that, that terrorism is top of the tree, and probably that's the way it should be, uh, because people dying in the street is obviously, at the end of the day, going to be yeah. count for more than, than uh, foreign interference issues. But, but both the service and the RCMP do spend time on those issues uh, and do follow those issues, so I would be surprised if they're not aware of, 
uh, many of the instances. Thank you. Um, for all these questions, I think I agree with two of them. Uh, I mean, especially on Charles' point, I cannot agree more because um, China became such a major force in our everyday life. So how should we behave just like what he Charles listed, a whole list? Do we ever uh, dare to say what we want and uh, what we stand for? I think that's very important because for me, actually, I do have fear. Like, I, I'm an economist. I don't want to get involved in politics. So all, you see, whatever I say, I want to back up wanted to back up by the numbers. And, and also, I don't use any um, unpublished sources. So I'm very careful. Even then, I still feel, oh, can I say this in this kind of occasion or that kind? Then uh, I want to take the liberty to pick up two uh, questions or comments in, um, in the audience I missed. First is the gentleman um, comment on the Chinese history. I found that we are so genuinely try to rationalize why China behave this way and think this way. We think about their history or whatever. But when I travel in India, I, I did think hard. India had, was the colony of UK, right? Mm -hmm. So when, after they uh, declared in independence, and I don't see any hostility against the UK or any historical burden or baggage on their mind or whatever. They never say, we got control, we got to do something to revenge or get even. So is that Chinese mentality a healthy one or unhealthy one? Should we always try to rationalize that, okay, they should do this, even when they were building the South China Sea, the islands? Someone, very famous person, talking about, well, US, when it was rising, it occupied this or that, and China should allow them. So I'm not a politician. I just feel that's not right. <laughs> but let you debate. And the other question about what if Acon, uh, CCCC Acon deal doesn't go through, does that impact our investment? I want to pick up on this. I feel like why we are so afraid if this deal doesn't go through, the foreign investment will fall off the cliff. I think at the time, the same thing command, commented by a politician, also saying the same thing, but I think why our Canadians didn't think our own issue? For example, this, what's the pipeline? I don't remember the name. Transmount. Currently, no, Transmount. currently Kinder going Morgan. on. Kinder yeah. Kinder Morgan. Yeah. So three pipelines went through like uh, um, assessment or whatever. None of them has been gone through. No. Something wrong with our system. Yes. Yeah. Like two NDP governors fight, <laughs> fought about, uh, like block each other. So something wrong with our system itself. Because before, when I put these numbers on, I said Canada's outward FDI is more than inward. Means we do have money, but we don't invest in our own land. What's the issue here? Anyone look at this issue, or we just constantly say, oh, if we reject China, we won't have FDI. That's really narrow-minded, isolated view. So I just want to raise this. I don't know much about the system or political system or setting. So, but I thought that's an interesting question. These are powerful questions, Vanjie, and I couldn't think of a finer point to conclude the panel over. Um, uh, may I ask for all of you to thank Duanji, Ward, and Charles for their amazing panel. So, may I also suggest, uh, Duanji, I, I look forward to reading you much more everywhere as you raise these questions of 
what Canadian sovereignty is and what it's worth and what the purpose of our country is. Ward, uh, I had a chance to see you in as a senior public servant. Uh, you were mighty at your job. It's so nice to see you in retirement. Uh, I look forward to seeing your contributions in our national debate even more pronounced. I think they're absolutely essential. And Charles, you're, you're colorful as a commentator. You're always educating in how we read and learn about China and other issues around the world. So thank you for, for making this entire world accessible to Canadians. So once again, uh, please thank this. Our conversation today on Canada's policy on foreign investment could not have happened were it not the work of uh, the exceptional colleagues I have at the McDonald Laurie Institute. Uh, so for David McDonough, David Watson, Allison, Sultan, Amber, Haley, George, and of course Dr. Brian Lee Crowley, I'm hoping I didn't miss any of my colleagues. Uh, please, a deep warm thank you for Our website is uh, www.mcdonaldlaurier.ca. Please contribute to enriching our national debate by going to the Donate tab and, and, and paying for this event because we don't have big Chinese state-owned enterprise. <laughs> I know what we're trying to do. Uh, please also sign up for our newsletter and stay in touch and spread the word that an independent public policy house like the McDonald Laurie Institute will be unafraid to challenge the ideas of what Canada's interests are in the world, uh, to do so ambiguously, thoughtfully, fair, fairly, uh, and certainly uh, with a great sense of pride in our own country. Thank you very much for coming and look forward to seeing you again soon. Good afternoon.